Hello. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to class. I can see some new students. Sarita, Ajit. <coughs> okay. So good evening. You can just um, go through the recording of the previous classes to catch up with what has been done so far. All right. So now today we are going to study about the production function in yesterday class of Professor Vashisht, uh, Kelvin was there and uh, Prabha was there. So Kelvin and Prabha, you uh, know what is this topic about, isn't it? If I am right, Kelvin and Prabha, you were there in the last class. Is that so? Good evening, Rezi. Alright. So, I will be just uh, doing that topic only because with BBA students, this is my first class for this topic. Okay, Prabha? So, I will be doing that only. Yeah, Kelvin. So, um, and uh, you can just... Uh, like uh, your concept will become much clearer and I think Seher was also there. So three of the students attended the class yesterday, uh, the class which was held yesterday. So they are already aware of that topic. Alright, so I'll just uh, start with this and then we'll go through a video. The video is very informative. It is like uh, just a synopsis of the whole topic. Hmm? Yeah, Prabha. It is uh, exactly same. Yeah, the same topic is there, the production function topic. Okay. Alright. So, uh, starting with uh, what is production, I'll just uh, ask uh, Prabha, Seher and uh, Kelvin to answer that question because they already know the answer. In fact, uh, all of you can try. What is production? What is production? Production is the transformation of goods from raw material into finished products. Isn't it? It is the, it is transforming goods from the raw material into finished product. So it's a very important function for uh, every business and especially those who are into the business of manufacturing. Yes, converting uh, inputs into outputs. Yeah. That is the definition for production and it not only includes the physical transformation but also all the processes which are a part of that whole series. They will form a part of the uh, production process. Yes, manufacturing raw material to finished product and um, the other things which are there like there are various uh, functions which are there uh, talking to the suppliers, getting the quotations hiring workers, deciding their wages, 
deciding about the rent of the land the premises uh, getting machinery equipment then uh, deciding about uh, the production pattern everything so they all will be a part of the production process all the functions they will form the form a part of the same series okay and uh, uh, yes prabha you are right it also includes the services not only physical goods but services like banking service insurance service uh, railway service that all will be a part of the uh, production process all right so you know, basically uh, this topic tells us about the production function of any any firm and this production function means converting the raw material into finished product so for that process we need some inputs they, those inputs can be the efforts of labor the land on which the work will be done maybe the factory may be set up or agricultural uh, uh, cropping can be done agriculture will take place so land then labor will be there which is going to assist in the process of manufacturing goods then there will be capital investment like we need machinery to make uh, to convert the raw material into the finished product so basically labor land capital they are going to form the part of the uh, they are going to be the basic raw material which we are going to use and apart from this there is uh, one another input that is entrepreneur the entrepreneur is the one who decides on things he is the decision maker so these are known as the factors of production okay so there are basically four factors of production you can just follow what is being written on the whiteboard factors of production so there are four factors of production number 1 is land what is happening okay i'll just write over here only so first is land then number 2 is labor number 3 is capital and number 4 is entrepreneur okay so sorry sorry for the wrong spelling so uh, basically these are the four basic factors of production so uh, this land refers to the uh, the land the physical land that will be used if it's an agricultural firm then the land will be the uh, only thing that is needed but if it's a manufacturing unit land will mean the premises uh, or rather the place on which the premises has been set up okay the factory has been constructed that will be the land hello prabha hello prabha can you hear me am i audible hello hello okay okay uh i need to format my laptop that is the reason why this problem is happening i guess okay so land is that then labor labor means the physical labor which we are going to use so the labor will be the second factor of production and it is perhaps the most important one okay so we pay wages to the labor and they work work for us then the third is capital this is also a very important factor of production capital means the money which we are going to invest into the business from this money we can get the machinery equipments 
we can uh, hire a building or we can set up the office so that all will form a part of the capital investment so this is the third and a very important factor of production then the fourth one is entrepreneur so entrepreneur is the one who initiates the process of business or initiates the process of production he conceives the idea and gives physical form to it so that is one factor but when we talk about this production function or when we talk about production from the point of view of a firm we just consider the labor and capital as the important factors of production because these are the factors of production which we can change over a period of time so for every firm or rather for every business the total time period is divided into two classes the long run and the short run okay so can you tell me the short run what is short run time period or rather what is the difference between long run and short run uh 3 months to 1 year okay this is short run and it can be even one month one month to one year it cannot be more than a year okay so that is the short run for every firm and long run is more than a year generally 3 years 5 years 7 years whatever so in this time period of short run and long run the factors of production becomes variable when we talk about short run in the short run only labor is that factor which we can increase or decrease okay if we if the need is there we can uh, hire more labor if the need is not there we can just uh, keep some labor out of the production process is it clear to everybody variable means changing De uh, daisy that's changing ajit Sahar, is that clear? Kelvin. Okay. So that is a variable factor of production. Then uh, fixed is the one that cannot be varied. If I talk about land, land is one factor which you cannot change in a very short period of time. You cannot generate more land. Uh, land and so that we we assume that it's a fixed factor of production then similar is with capital capital is the investment which means the money so we cannot uh, increase the capital in the very short run in the period of 1 month to 1 year uh, in one year it is a little manageable but in the time span of 1 month or 3 months it is not very feasible to change the volume of capital that has been invested in the business so in the short run we assume that labor is the only factor which can be varied varied means changed as per our need and in the long run the all the factors can be changed so this is the difference between the long run and the short run okay got that the bifurcation of long run and short run all right so now we go to the main content so what is production it refers to the transformation of inputs or resources into outputs of goods and services in other words production refers to all of the activities involved in the production of goods and services from borrowing to set up or expand production facilities to hiring workers purchasing raw material running quality control cost accounting and so on rather than referring merely to the physical transformation of inputs into outputs so this is the definition of production function it is not only the physical transformation but all the uh, services uh, all the processes will form a part of it or functions now here are some examples you can just read them just read them quickly
रेड ओके सो नाउ व्हेन वी कम टू इकोनॉमिक्स व्हेन इट कम्स टू इकोनॉमिक्स देन everything has to be represented with the help of a formula so the formula for the representation of production function is this q is equal to f k l n l a so those who were there in the class in the last class they must already be knowing this so q stands for the level of output or the production f is the function of k is for capital L is for land and L A is for labor. So production is a function of capital, land, and labor. All right. This is the mathematical representation of this whole uh, production function. Now there are two distinct types of production functions. that show the possible range of substitution inputs in the production process so we can say uh, there is a fixed proportion production function and there is variable proportion so this is what i have discussed with you means uh, we can divide the factors of production into fixed factors and variable factors so in the short run all the factors except labor is fixed and in the long run all the factors are variable they can be changed this is the basic assumption so what is short term time when one input remains constant and an addition to output can be obtained only by using more labor that is the short term in long run both the inputs become variable both means the labor and the capital they both are variable they can be changed so this law of production it states the relationship between the output and the input and it is important from the perspective of a firm to know the optimum level of production it should go for or it should try and attain So that is why this is law is of importance so in the short run the relationship between input and output are studied by varying one input others being held constant so law of variable proportions brings out the relationship between the varying proportions of factor inputs and output okay so now let us go to the main part now what are the assumptions of this law it says that one factor say l now l denotes the labor okay so l is variable and the other factors are constant labor is homogeneous technology remains constant and input prices are given so labor is homogeneous this is this was explained yesterday so can you just tell me kelvin prabha and sahar Uh, what is the meaning of this labor is homogeneous same kind yes it is same kind by nature and it is of same type and the level of efficiency is also the same okay if one labor is giving us 8 uh, units of output the other will also give us 8 units of output this is what we assume this is just an assumption okay practically it cannot be so is it clear surajit sarita sahar ajit praveen <coughs> kelvin rezi danny okay so technology remains constant that is also an assumption practically it does not happen then input prices are given that is a uh, very obvious we need to know the cost of the inputs we are putting into the manufacturing so now uh, here comes a table which shows the this law of variable proportions how it operates and what is the meaning of that so you can see there are four columns over here 
the first one is for the workers we have assumed that labor is the only factor which can be changed uh, in the short run so labor is the changeable factor and it is there in the column one then total production marginal production average production okay total product means the uh, output which we are getting marginal is the addition to the total production and average means the per unit production so there are mathematical formulas for them which we will be discussing in a while so you view uh, starting with labor one the total productivity of labor one is 24 means when we are using only one labor we are getting an output of 24 units so marginal production is also 24 and average production is also 24 let us first uh, discuss only total production column okay when two labors are working 72 units are being manufactured three labors 138 units four labors 216 five labors 300 units so this way the production is continuously increasing till the 10th unit you can see at the 10th unit it is 600 but at the 11th unit it has gone down to 594 from 600 to 594 then from 12th unit it is 552 okay so now the production has started declining isn't it from the 11th unit it is going down continuously can you see that everybody Sarita Surajit okay so now yes there are reasons Ajit for this which we are going to see later you know this is because of the, uh, the uh, tendency of getting the uh, reaching the optimum level like when we were discussing the, uh, you were not there in that class I guess, we have discussed a law of uh, diminishing marginal utility for the consumer. So in that law as more and more units were consumed by the consumer, as he was eating more and more of pizza, then what was happening? His level of satisfaction from every additional unit was going down. So this is what is applicable over here also we are using the resources so resources are giving their best so we can say by the 10th unit the resources has been utilized to their optimum from 11th unit onwards the production is going down that means now the resources have reached their saturation point and now they cannot yield positive results any further okay so uh, marginal product is yeah, Denny, I'll tell you that marginal product means, uh, the word marginal means addition to the total. Okay, so marginal product means addition to the total production because of employment of one extra unit. So you can see when there were one worker, 24 units were manufactured. When two workers, then 72. So what is the productivity of this second labor? It is 72 sorry 72 minus 24 okay so the answer is 48 one unit uh, one labor alone was giving 24 units two labors together are giving 72 units so what is the uh, role of second labor or what is the productivity of the second labor it is 72 minus 24 okay what is the productivity of the third labor it is 138 minus 72 then is that clear okay so now we come to this column of marginal product you can see uh, for second labor it's 48 for third it's 66 66 is 138 minus 72 for fourth labor it is 78 216 minus 138 okay 
of fifth labor is 300 total production marginal is 84 300 minus 216 the difference between the fifth and the fourth unit that is the marginal product for fifth labor okay so you can just uh, re read this column once everybody all of you read it all the units you have any doubts please ask Is it done? Now coming to the 10th unit. It is 600. Now at 11th unit it is 594 minus 600. That is minus 6. For the 12th unit it is 552 minus 594. That is minus 42. Okay. So this is how the marginal product is being calculated. Now in the middle stages like for the fifth unit the marginal productivity is 84 for the sixth unit also it is 84. Now from seventh unit it is 78. For eighth it's 66, for ninth it's 48. So now what is happening is the marginal productivity is now going down. It is declining. Isn't it? It is now declining and by the 11th unit it has become negative and for 12th it is even more uh, negative. So this is how the marginal productivity behaves. Initially it increases, it increases at a very fast rate, then it starts declining and towards the end it becomes negative. Okay, clear to everybody? Okay, so this is marginal product column. Then next is the average product. Average product is very easy to calculate. We divide the total production with the number of units. Like for the first unit it is 24. It's because 24 divided by 1. For second it's 72 divided by 2. That is 36. For third one 138 divided by 3. It's like simple mathematical calculation as we used to do for averages if you remember. If you have studied averages you all must have same calculation. Total divided by the number of units. 260 divided by 4. So 54. Clear? Till the last unit. 552 divided by 12. 46. So uh, this is average product. So in the average product column also you can see average product is increasing from 24 to 36, then 46, then 54, 60, 64, 66, again 66 and now it is declining. From 66 it has come to 64, now 60, now 54, now 46, isn't it? So it has now started declining. So what is the nature of average product? Average product increases but increases at a rate lower than the marginal product. Marginal product become 40, became 48 and this is 36. This is now 66 but it is only 46. It has reached 78 and it is still 54. So both are increasing but marginal product is increasing at a much higher rate than the average product. And now when it is going down then also the marginal product is going down at a faster rate. From uh, 84 it has come down to 78, then 66, now 48 and then 24. It has even become negative but average product does not become the, becomes negative.
ओके एनी डाउट एनी बडी रिगार्डिंग दिस सरिता ओके ऑल राइट सो दिस इज दीज आर दू थ्री मेन कॉलम्स फॉर दिस प्रोडक्टिविटी नाउ वेन वी दिस इज द होल प्रोसेस so this whole process of production is divided into different segments so the first one the first stage is the stage of increasing returns it is increasing returns because continuously the marginal product is increasing okay and marginal product is a very is the most important indicator because uh, marginal productivity shows the productivity of the individual labor we have to pay wages to the labor so is it like advisable to pay that wage to the labor is he contributing to the total production that we come to know with the help of the marginal product so marginal product is a very important indicator in this whole chart so this is the stage of increasing returns till the sixth unit because till the sixth unit the uh, average product is also increasing and marginal product is also increasing and in marginal product is very important that is the most important criteria for us like the sixth labor is fifth labor is giving 84 units and the sixth labor is also giving 84 units so we can manage till the sixth labor till the time we are getting the uh, till 84 units so that is fine now for seventh unit from seventh unit onwards the pro marginal product is going down so this is the stage of diminishing returns diminishing means going down decreasing so now it is decreasing so this is the stage of diminishing returns from seven, from 84 to 78 from 78 to 66 from 66 to 48 so this is the diminishing return and now towards the end for the 11th and the 12th unit it is the stage of negative returns okay everybody yes deni uh, that is the most important indicator okay because that is when uh, that is what the labor is doing for the uh, production process we have to pay wages to the labor so that is adding to our cost so whether we should pay that wage or not that is being decided with the help of the marginal productivity column yeah, yeah, yeah. so this is uh, it so there are three stages this is uh, these three stages are there when we talk about the uh, production in the short run okay so the, this whole is known as the law of variable returns or the law of variable proportions all right so now what we are going to do uh, we will now be plotting these points on a uh, in in a form of a chart so what we will get so you can see uh, here is a diagram panel a so what is this panel a this is showing the total production total production of the labor so this indicates number 1 total production rises at an increasing rate till the employment of the first shift worker beyond the sixth worker and until the tenth worker total production increases but the rate of increase begins to fall total production turns negative from the 11th worker onwards so this shows the law of diminishing marginal returns so let us go back to that from the fifth till the fifth labor it is continuously increasing total production it is increasing at the increasing rate so when we will plot it over here so we can assume like this is the best point the optimum point so this optimum point indicates the 
fifth unit of labor. This is the point of fifth unit of labor. Okay, this is the point till where the production is, uh, or rather, this is not the fifth unit. Uh, I'm sorry, I assessed it wrong. Actually, that is the tenth unit because till the tenth unit, the production is increasing. So this is tenth unit of labor. Now, from here is the uh, rather from here is the 11th unit and the 12th unit when the production is going down okay now going ahead this is panel B panel B shows the average production and the marginal production so as we saw in that table Marginal production was increasing at the increasing rate. So this is what is happening over here also. When we plot it, we will get a graph like this. It is increasing at a very high rate and when it is falling, it is going down very quickly. You can see. You can see it's going down very quickly and it has even become negative. Beyond this point, it is negative. This is for the 11th and the 12th unit. Now coming to average production, average production is also increasing but it is increasing at a rate lower than that of the marginal production. So this is the reason why average production curve is lower, uh, is placed lower than the marginal production curve. Okay. Is it clear the two uh, the two these charts? Okay. So now first stage is the stage of increasing returns. So in this one, the total production increases at an increasing rate. So what is the reason behind this? It is because the fixed factor that is K, K is for capital. The capital is abundant and the variable factor is inadequate. Means we have lots of machinery with us, but the labor which we are employing initially is less. It's inadequate as per the need. So that is why the labor is, uh, sorry, the, uh, the machinery is being utilized very well. And we can say it is underutilized. It is not utilized to its maximum capacity. That is why uh, the, uh, there is the stage of increasing returns. In the stage two, total production also continues to increase but at a diminishing rate. We saw in the stage of diminishing return. The production was increasing but now at a very slow rate. And by stage 3, the production begins to decline, total production. It is because the, now the capital has become scarce. As we have employed more and more laborers on the machinery, the machinery, uh, we can say the, ma the machinery capacity is now less than what it was previously. So there is over utilization of the capital and that is why there is setting in of the diminishing returns. This is the reason why diminishing returns starts operating. Like when we will, uh, as we will employ more and more laborers on the same machinery, same work can be done by five workers. Now we are employing eight workers. So the three workers are not contributing to the production. It is just a wastage of money. So we are into the third stage now. The production is now declining. Okay. So this is the basic reason for that. And what are the causes of three stages? One is indivisibility and inelasticity elasticity of the fixed factor. The fixed factor, that is the 
land capital they are indivisible and they are inelastic they cannot be uh, varied inelastic means they cannot be changed over a period of time like um, as we saw in the case of labor which can be changed and then they are imperfect substitutes of each other capital and labor cannot be substituted for each other if like there is a task that has to be done by labor only we can just use a labor for that work we cannot use machinery because machine is not going to work so these are the basic reasons why these laws operate now what is the significance of this it is important uh, as it is observed in various production activities particularly in the agriculture where natural factors play an important role and they are very limited land land is the main uh, main production factor for agriculture and it is limited in amount so we need to uh, allocate proper resources at the proper time to get the best output out of that limited land with us then helps manager in identifying the rational and irrational stages of operation so it's very help helpful to the management so what what are the basic questions that are answered by this one how much to produce what number of workers to employ in order to maximize the output so in our example the firm should employ a minimum of 7 workers and a maximum of 10 workers where the total production is still rising okay let us go back to that uh, chart and see sorry yes so it says that the firm should employ a minimum of 7 workers because till the 7 workers the production is increasing okay and uh, sorry from 7 to 10 it is increasing it should not go beyond the 10th worker minimum of 7 workers and a maximum of 10 workers that is the point at which we should stop we should not up, go beyond the 10th worker because beyond 10th the production is continuously declining the marginal production is negative and total production is also continuously going down so there is no point in applying that okay so we will mainly judge it on the basis of the marginal productivity uh because marginal productivity till the sixth labor is all right it is same for the fifth and the sixth labor so we can go till sixth labor uh, and if we uh, at the most we can go for seventh labor that is it we cannot go beyond that it's not advisable to do that as per this example okay so uh, the stage 3 has a very uh, yes ji that is more prof that is very profitable but uh, when we go for mass production then we uh look at a bigger picture okay so we can uh, we can just afford to go one or two units ahead of that like from fifth to we can go to the seventh labor a firm is uh, like capable enough to bear that beyond that we sh we should not go into uh, losses that is the target so stage 3 has a very high lnk ratio lnk ratio means labor capital ratio so as a result the additional labor not only prove unproductive but also cause a decline in the total production okay the number of workers towards the third stage is too high so that is why the total production is going down so in stage 1 the capital is underutilized and stage 3 it is over utilized so that is why in stage 3 we have to decrease the labor so this is production function with one variable now there is another topic to this that is production function with two variables like when labor and capital both can be changed then what should be the 
approach of the firm. That is the second part of this topic which we are going to do in the next class. Okay. In this class, that is it. We have done today production function with one labor. Uh, sorry, one factor, one variable factor. In the next class, we'll do it with two variable factors. If the two factors can be changed, what should be the uh, approach taken by the firm? All right. So now, what I'll do is I'll take you to a video. Please watch this. It's a very informative one, and then we'll get back. Please watch it carefully, everyone. today's lesson, we're going to examine the effect of adding additional units of labor to the production of a particular good in the short run. Today's topic is part of the microeconomics unit on the theory of the firm, in which we examine the behaviors of firms in particular markets in terms of how many workers they wish to hire, how much output they wish to produce, and what kinds of prices they wish to charge for their products. Before we get into details about the cost and price decisions of firms, we're going to talk about a concept called the law of diminishing marginal returns. Now, let's look at our example here. We're going to be looking at the short run production in a toy truck factory. We have labor, which is represented by our workers on the left. We have capital, which is represented by the tools in the next column over. And what we're going to measure is the change in the output of toy trucks that results from the addition of units of labor to the production of toy trucks in this factory. So we'll also record the total product or the total output of toy trucks and the marginal product, which is the change in total product for each additional unit of labor added. So first let's make an assumption here. We're going to assume that the quantity of capital is fixed in the short run. In other words, our factory cannot vary the number of tools or technology that it employs towards the production of trucks. We can think of it this way. There's one factory, and we can add more and more workers to that factory, but we cannot build additional factories or acquire more equipment to put in our factory. So the only variable resource in this exercise is going to be labor, the number of workers. So let's start with our factory in which there are three sets of tools and only one worker working in that factory. If one worker joins this factory and there are three sets of tools, we can assume that that one worker will be relatively unproductive and in one day will be able to manufacture one toy truck. So our total product with one worker and three tools is one toy truck. The marginal product of the first unit of labor, therefore, is one toy truck. Marginal product measures the change in total product attributable to each additional worker. Now let's go over to our quantity of labor column and see what happens when we add additional workers. Let's assume that the factory owner hires one additional worker. So now there are two workers employed in the production of toy trucks. However, since we are in the short run, the amount of capital available remains fixed at only three. We can assume that with a second worker added to the production process, the productivity or the efficiency with which the three sets of tools are used will increase, and the total product of the three workers will exceed the total product of one worker by two additional trucks. Now, due to the fact that the second worker enabled this factory to work more efficiently, three trucks are able to be produced, giving us a total product of three and a marginal product of two trucks. Of course, the marginal product refers to the change in total product attributable to the additional worker. Therefore, as one more worker was added, the total product increased by two trucks, giving us a marginal product of two. Now the factory owner decides to hire a third worker. So in the next round we're going to have three workers employed but again the amount of capital is fixed since we're in the short run here. With three workers the productivity increases even further and now instead of three trucks the three workers combined are able to produce six trucks total. 
The capital is being used very efficiently now since each worker has his own set of tools to work at. All capital can be used efficiently giving us a marginal product of three trucks. So far the efficiency of each additional worker has exceeded the efficiency of the previous worker. In the short run as additional units of labor are added to our factory the existing capital is used more and more efficiently. Now what happens if we add a fourth worker to this factory. In the next round, let's employ four workers towards the production of trucks. Again, however, the quantity of capital is fixed since we are in the short run. Now the fourth worker will not have the luxury of having tools to work with. The fourth worker may be able to contribute to the production process, but not by the extent to which the third, second, or first worker added to the production. So what is likely to happen is that with four workers, the total product will continue to rise, but it will start to rise at a diminishing rate. So let's say the total product with the fourth worker goes from six trucks to eight trucks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight trucks. Total product continues to rise. However, the marginal product now begins to decline. The fourth worker only adds two additional trucks to the production process. This is explained by the fact that there are no additional tools for the fourth worker to use. The quantity of capital is fixed and only labor is changing. Now what if the factory owner decided to hire a fifth worker? In the next round, let's add one additional worker for a total quantity of labor of six. And we'll keep the number of tools available at only three pairs. And the total product will once again increase but we will see it increase at even a slower rate. So let's say that only nine trucks are made when the fifth worker is hired. The output attributable to the fifth worker is only one truck now. The marginal product of labor has declined. The additional number of trucks attributable to each additional worker is now less due to the fact that there are simply no more tools for additional workers to use. While total product continues to increase, the marginal product begins to decrease. Now what happens if a sixth worker is hired? Clearly there are no more tools for these workers to use. The sixth worker may be able to contribute to production, but it's more likely that the sixth worker is only inhibiting or getting in the way of the other workers on the factory floor who all have tools to use. The sixth worker will have no tools to use and may actually lead to a decrease in the total product. Let's assume that with six workers, total product actually decreases from nine to eight trucks. This means that the additional output attributable to the six worker is actually negative one truck. The six worker decreases the total output of trucks due to the fact that at this point, he's only getting in the way. There is no way that six workers can lead to more production in the short run given the fact that the quantity of capital available is limited to only three sets of tools. So how would this look if we were to take the information in this table and plot it in a numerical table and on a graph? Let's look at the next page here. What we've done is we've added workers. When we had one worker, two workers, three workers, four workers, five, and six, the marginal product of labor changed each time we added additional workers. At first, one worker contributed only one truck to the production process. The output attributable to the second worker was two trucks, since capital was able to be used more efficiently. With the third worker, we saw marginal product go from two to three, and total product increased from three to six trucks. Capital is now being used very efficiently, with the fourth worker, however, total output increased to only eight trucks, meaning that the fourth worker added only two additional trucks to the total output of this firm. Upon hiring the fifth worker, total output went up to nine trucks, meaning the marginal product of the fifth worker was one truck. And upon hiring six workers, total output declined back to eight trucks, meaning the marginal product was actually negative. The sixth worker led to a decrease in the total productivity of our truck factory. If we plot these points on our marginal product graph on the right here, we'll have a marginal product curve. Let's do that now. On our x-axis is the quantity of labor from zero to six workers. 
on our vertical axis is the quantity of output attributable to each additional worker or the marginal product from zero to six. So at one worker, the marginal product was one. At two workers, the marginal product was two. The third worker's marginal product was three. However, the fourth worker's marginal product began to decline. And with five workers, it was down to one. And with six workers, the marginal product was actually negative one. If we connect these dots, what we have is a marginal product curve for labor in our toy truck factory in the short run. This is the output attributable to additional workers added to a fixed amount of capital in our toy factory. Let's make some observations about this curve now. One thing we notice is that when workers are first hired, there is a range over which marginal product increases. This we refer to as the range of increasing marginal returns. Between zero and three workers, each additional worker hired actually led to an increase in the productivity of labor, meaning that additional workers were more productive than those hired before them. Now the reason for increasing marginal returns is efficiency. The three tools available in this factory could not be used efficiently by only one or two workers, and in fact it required three workers to achieve the full efficiency of capital use in our factory. However, beyond three workers, we began to see the marginal product of labor decline. This range of our marginal product curve is explained by the concept of diminishing marginal returns. Diminishing marginal returns occurs beyond three workers in our toy truck factory. The explanation for why diminishing marginal returns occurs is decreasing efficiency. Because the amount of capital available in our factory is fixed, additional workers beyond three only begin to get in the way of the more productive workers hired before them. Of course, total output in our factory continued to increase until we hired the sixth worker. However, it increased at a decreasing rate. The fourth and fifth workers contributed to the output of the factory. However, they contributed at a decreasing rate. There was simply not enough capital to go around, and by the time the sixth worker was hired, he actually reduced the productivity of all the other workers in this factory, and the factory's total output fell from nine toy trucks to only eight toy trucks. So in this video lesson, we have shown how when a variable resource, in this case labor, is added to a fixed resource in the short run, in this case capital, at first, the productivity of the variable resource will increase, as we see here. Marginal product increases until the third worker, but beyond three workers in our factory, the marginal product of labor decreased due to the law of diminishing marginal returns. Due to the fact that capital is fixed and labor is variable, workers beyond a certain point are no longer contributing to an increase in the production of this good. If we were to add a seventh, an eighth, or a ninth worker to this factory, the factory would become so crowded and all the workers would therefore become so unproductive that the total product of the factory would begin to decline, perhaps even fall to zero, if the factory became too crowded and there was absolutely no way that anybody could make efficient use of the existing capital. The principle of diminishing returns says that beyond a certain quantity of workers, the output attributable to each additional worker will decrease due to the falling efficiency with which existing capital can be used in the short run. In order for a firm to overcome diminished returns, more capital would have to be added to the production process. Now that would require a long run acquisition of more capital, and that will be covered in a later video lesson.
and with five workers it was down to one and with six workers the marginal product was actually negative one. If we connect these dots what we have is a marginal product curve for labor in our toy truck factory in the short run. This is the output attributable to additional workers added to a fixed amount of capital in our toy factory. Let's make some observations about this curve now. One thing we notice is that when workers are first hired, there is a range over which marginal product increases. This we refer to as the range of increasing marginal returns. Between zero and three workers, each additional worker hired actually led to an increase in the productivity of labor, meaning that additional workers were more productive than those hired before them. Now the reason for increasing marginal returns is efficiency. The three tools available in this factory could not be used efficiently by only one or two workers, and in fact it required three workers to achieve the full efficiency of capital use in our factory. However, beyond three workers, we began to see the marginal product of labor decline. This range of our marginal product curve is explained by the concept of diminishing marginal returns. Diminishing marginal returns occurs beyond three workers in our toy truck factory. The explanation for why diminishing marginal returns occurs is decreasing efficiency. Because the amount of capital available in our factory is fixed, additional workers beyond three only begin to get in the way of the more productive workers hired before them. Of course, total output in our factory continued to increase until we hired the sixth worker. However, it increased at a decreasing rate. The fourth and fifth workers contributed to the output of the factory. However, they contributed at a decreasing rate. There was simply not enough capital to go around, and by the time the sixth worker was hired, he actually reduced the productivity of all the other workers in this factory, and the factory's total output fell from nine toy trucks to only eight toy trucks. So in this video lesson, we have shown how when a variable resource, in this case labor, is added to a fixed resource in the short run, in this case capital, at first, the productivity of the variable resource will increase, as we see here. Marginal product increases until the third worker, but beyond three workers in our factory, the marginal product of labor decreased due to the law of diminishing marginal returns. Due to the fact that capital is fixed and labor is variable, workers beyond a certain point are no longer contributing to an increase in the production of this good. If we were to add a seventh, an eighth, or a ninth worker to this factory, the factory would become so crowded and all the workers would therefore become so unproductive that the total product of the factory would begin to decline, perhaps even fall to zero, if the factory became too crowded and there was absolutely no way that anybody could make efficient use of the existing capital. The principle of diminishing returns says that beyond a certain quantity of workers, the output attributable to each additional worker will decrease due to the falling efficiency with which existing capital can be used in the short run. In order for a firm to overcome diminished returns, more capital would have to be added to the production process. Now that would require a long run acquisition of more capital, and that will be covered in a later video lesson.
did you all understand the video okay all right so thanks for your time everybody and uh, we'll be meeting in the next class and we'll be doing the second part of this topic in the next class your next class will be on sunday all right so mind it you are there for the class so you don't miss out on this important topic thanks for your time everybody good night take care of yourself and please fill the feedback form which you are going to get at the end of the class okay thanks everyone thanks for your time bye have a great weekend bye please fill the feedback form thanks